Oh, hello! My name is Mara and welcome to Books Like Whoa. So I don't know how today's video is gonna go guys because I I feel like <sighs> Where to even start with this? I wanted in this month of talking about romance because I'm talking a lot about things I like about romance. I did have my um, tropes, romance tropes I hate video, but I think it's really important in the scheme of genres to acknowledge that there's both good and bad. And I had a lot of recommendation videos, so I was like, I need to pick a representatively bad book in romance and talk about why it's bad. And I was thinking about which one I should do, and I was like, oh, that one. That book that I still have friends ask me about because when I was reading it I kept being like listen to this passage. So anyway I wanted to talk about a book that is not good and but it's not even it's not the worst book I've ever read. What I've realized is it's the like the craziest book I've ever read. It's the weirdest book I've ever read and that's because I think it actually has interesting elements to it so it's not like it's not the worst written book ever. It, it's not well written but it's not the worst written. It's not the worst characterized. It's not the worst plotted but it's bad and all of those areas, but it has like these higher aspirations for itself. And anyway, I like, let's just get into this. It's Ritual of Proof by Dara Joy. If you know anything about romance, you probably may have heard of this before because it's kind of infamous because it has like high premise and such low delivery on that high premise that um, it's sort of notorious. Now, I should also tell you, there are people who love this book and who essentially say like the high premise is enough for them to enjoy this book. I am not one of them and I don't even know how to be, I don't know how to talk about this book. Like I, do you see, I was re, I reread this for this review and like, I don't know if you can tell, I have so many little markers of like, sh what, like what? I have to talk to them about that, but there's so many that like, I can't do that. Let me start with the synopsis and then like, maybe I'll try to break down why this book like does, like such weird things to my brain. I'm not even gonna attempt to come up with my own synopsis for this because like it's too much. So like I'm literally just gonna read you the back copy and you can like begin to understand. Joy gives us a different look at ourselves, our societies, our expectations and relationships and so much more. So like, okay, see, setting the like premise, the concept is very high. Ritual of Proof creates a vivid new world. It's a book you will remember long after you've reached its riveting conclusion. That is a fact, that is accurate. Good job, copy, That's, that is true. This is a dazzling tale of central intrigue and power set in a world where women have all the control and desirable men fetch staggering bed prices. An elite upper class dictates society's mores while the vices of its rich influential she lords are politely overlooked. I think you see where this might be going. Set against a sweeping canvas of political conspiracies, that's a little overselling, the Marquel Green Tamarin decides to marry, making an alliance with an influential family and consolidating her position among her peers. So she fastens a defiant Jorlin Reynard to her house and to her bed. And so the ritual of proof begins for both of them. But there are forces conspiring against Green, especially from Claudine Dombert, her sworn enemy, a woman who would do anything to destroy her. Soon, Green must summon all of her considerable influence to fight, and in doing so, she does what society deems close to unthinkable and turns to Jorlin for help. She is both surprised and overwhelmed by his masterful abilities as both ally and husband. But when the validity of their union is called into question and a series of disasters befalls them, they realize that there is more than their place in society in danger. It's their very lives that are threatened. Okay. So if this, if you didn't get, pick up enough hints from this description, this is basically a Regency romance, gender swapped, set on the moon. I want you to, I want, I want you to think about that. Like just take, like pause this video for a minute, I'll wait, and like reflect on what you think that book is like. This book is so batshit crazy. Like, I, like, again, I just don't even totally know where to go with this. Like, let's put it this way. This book is so crazy and has so many made up words and so many like, 
terribly described world building elements it literally has a glossary okay there's literally a, literally a glossary and let me like let me just give you a sampling of this glossary because like there's there's some amazing things in here clee animal native to forest noted for its speed and unpredictable nature clue fussy sister animal to the clee noted for endurance and for being no noisy literally they like Okay, so like, you know sometimes in bad fantasy writing where like they just make up nonsense words and like try to sell you on it being another language? That is this book all over. Clee, Clue, like these are, they're basically horses. Like they're glorified horses. They're space horses. Like then she also has all the like made up swearing that drives me nuts. Like what are other things in here? Okay, Mac Mock, Foolish Talk. Major Domo is a female butler, sure. Male Tragedy Paradox. <laughs> I remember this. MTP, affliction that befalls an aroused male. What? <laughs> I don't, okay. So anyway, so like, I, I'm being so disorganized and I apologize for that. This book just literally breaks my brain. Again, the parts that I wanna affirm about this, I think what is interesting about this book, and I think the reason why people, some people really do love it, and the reason that they accurately tell you that it, you will remember it long after reaching its riveting conclusion, is that, it's interesting to have the gender swapped piece of this, right? So like, it's interesting because instead of having all these like debutantes like demurely kind of in the corner waiting for some man to like come up and ask them to dance, it's a bunch of dudes waiting demurely in the corner who have like chaperones and who are not intellectually like rigorous enough to participate in society. And like, it's all the women who like have they are called pleasurers, which are basically man mistresses that they keep <laughs> off to the side and they like, you know, smoke and gamble. And so like, that's an interesting idea, right? Like that's a very interesting thing to try to do. And I think that what I appreciate about this book is that there are times where you're laughing at it because you're like, oh, that's so silly to like, this guy is talking about like the headstrong young man who doesn't want to, you know, do what a woman tells him or whatever. Like you're laughing at it and then you realize like, oh wait, but like the whole, po the whole point of this book is that like all of those gender roles and like the gender paradigm is so arbitrary and so dumb. So like, why couldn't it be swapped? And it's like meant to kind of undercut your expectations. This is what I, I know, I am confident that's what Dara Joy was trying to do. However, unfortunately, Dara Joy is not a very skillful writer. In the midst of this very interesting idea, she just can't really sell you on it. Okay, so like one thing that she does is she tries to give you backstory in the middle of scenes and it's always so clunky and absurd that you it completely takes you out of any dramatic tension she might have been building. So like for instance, they're at, like this is like the opening like they see each other at a party thing and it says they're she host. Also the she's constantly putting she in front of nouns for no reason. Like wh okay, anyway. Their she host was generous tonight. Hamiri was prohibitively expensive. Here, at, in this gathering of the select quarter, the top slice, as they were called by the lower sets, nothing was too good. These nobles enjoyed their station in life. Most could trace their ancestry back to the commanders of the seed ship. A millennium ago, the moon called Forest had greeted the settlers with the warm, loving embrace of a new father trying desperately to comfort his infant. The outfit had thrived under the protection of such a loving shield. Jorlin frowned as perennial questions surfaced in his mind. Not much was remembered about Origin Point. Nothing was ever spoken aloud or handed down in their folklore regarding that time before. As a child, he'd often wondered about their shrouded past, how they had come to be where they are, and what life was like in the prehistoric times. Like, are you really thinking about that at a party? Like, if you're drinking this prohibitively expensive Hermari, are you really thinking about the seed ship and, like, where they all came from? Like, I just I think not, right? And then like, she's, she has a lot of scenes of them like having these confrontations because the whole point is that Jorlin, the man, is like very rebellious. Like he, he's like these typical um, historical romance heroines who like are bucking tradition. He's doing that and he's like, he's vowed he's never going to become a name bearer, which is what husbands are called in this world. So women are the name givers and the men are the name bearers. And there's a lot of very icky discussion about seed and seed being, like I don't even want to get into that that's its own that's its own thing but anyway he's he doesn't want to ever become a name bearer and his grandmother who is not a duke a duchine 
I went, let's not dwell on that. He has agreed that he doesn't have to become a name bearer unless he likes the person, but he's vowed he's never gonna like any of them. So anyway, like they're having their witty repartee. And like, these are the, this is the level of conversation, which could be an interesting conversation that they are able to have. And he's talking, oh, sorry. In this case, he's talking to his best friend, Limex. Jorlin exhaled, knowing the truth of his friend's words. You could refuse and shame my family with scandal. No, I am not like you, Jorlin. I am not one to forge my own path by breaking with society's mores, nor do I have an overly indulgent grandmother from a great house to cosset my whims. Jorlin clenched his jaw. It is no whim to desire the right of personal freedom. Limix shrugged. It is a man's duty to fasten, which is their word for marry slash fuck. It is a man's duty to fasten and produce heirs. Such is his ordained place. Ordained? Ordained by whom? Do you really believe this to be spirit law? Limix blanched. You speak sacrilege. Fortunately, I am used to your wild ways, my friend, but I caution you to hold your tongue. It would be better for all concerned if you let go of these radical ideas of yours. No good can come of it. Why is it considered extreme to want to choose the direction of your own life? Face it, Jorlin, we are the lesser sex. That is why our name givers take care of us. Left alone, we would fall to ruin. We are intellectually inferior. Left unmonitored, our innate male aggression would destroy this world. Again, in theory, the idea here is interesting, but it's just like the dialogue is so, it's so badly written that like you can't, it, oh, it's just like, I want to like this. Like I like the idea of this, but it's just so, badly written and they the, none of the characters are interesting and they all talk like they are reading from some sort of like badly written philosophical treatise and that just makes it like impossible to take this book seriously and it clearly I think what you need to understand is this book very clearly wants to be taken seriously on some level so like this is not like a Lindsay Sands book or Jessica Sims or whoever like there are plenty of silly romances that I read and enjoy because the author is like self-aware of the silliness this is a book that like thinks it is being very deep and wants you to take it seriously. And it's just like, nah, girl, that ain't, I, I can't, you are talking literally about seed ships and like name bearers. I can't take this that seriously. And like I said, it's just, it's hard because like in these dramatic scenes, people will say things that like literally I was laughing out loud. Like literally my neighbors probably thought I was crazy because I was sitting over here cackling in my armchair. So the Marquell Green, Tamarin, I think that's her name. She's offered for Jorlin essentially because she, like this other, her enemy, her enemy, Claudine D'Ambert, who we will talk about again later, but like Claudine D'Ambert has offered for Jorlin and, and Green knows that this would like ruin him and she's friends with his family. So she's gonna offer for him. Plus she wants to bone. So like that's gonna happen. But like, okay, so this is a very tense scene where they're supposed to be confronting Claudine D'Ambert and explaining that like, She's not gonna get Jorlin. Says furious, Claudine flung the scroll aside. You may get his veil. We haven't talked about that yet, we will. You may get his veil, but you will never keep him. That I promise you. She faced the Duchene with a sneer. And you, Duchene Reynard, have made an enemy this day. Be forewarned. The old woman drew herself up with the dignity of centuries of Reynards. Are you threatening me, she count? Her literal title, like what, like when she's filling out her driver's li license applications instead of Ms. or Ms. Mrs., it is she count. Her title is she count. And like, how am I supposed to take a book seriously that has people whose official like pass down title is she count? I just, I can't. Okay, and I just brought up the veil. So like, we need to, we gotta talk about this. I can't believe I've waited this long to talk about this because it's literally like this whole thing is tied up in the title, which is ritual of proof. Another part of the, I, like how am I gonna talk about this with a straight face? I can't. Another part of the world building of this book is that essentially there is meant to be a parallel between a hymen and what physiologically is happening with men in this world. So every man is born with a veil. And I'm just, you know what, at this point I'm thankful for the glossary because I can literally just read this to you and like, I was thankful for the glossary the first time I read this because I was like, I must be misunderstanding this. A veil is a small membrane which had a tiny break in it and grew over the head of the penis and could be ruptured properly only by the internal muscles and fluid from a woman's body. The first time, the first time of sex, the act was quite painful for the male. Guys, in this world, men have like 
a membrane that is dissolved by a woman's vag? Like, I, like, I'm sorry to be crude, but this is literally what is happening in this book. And also just like a momentary pause for like an anatomy lesson. And I am not a scientist, I'm not a biologist, so like, fair. But if you read actually a good book to, to get good information about this is Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski, I think. And the whole like hymen breaking thing is its own trope in romance genre. And like, here's, here's the bottom line. A hymen is, does not exist halfway up the vagina. A hymen is actually not even a thing in the way that we talk about it. Like, essentially, there's variances between women's anatomy, and if not properly prepared before sex the first few times, there can be blood and there can be ripping because essentially it is your muscle. Like, the outermost part of your vagina, not your vulva, like the outermost part of the vagina can be ruptured during the first few times of sex. So like, this whole idea of like a membrane is actually not... Like, it can appear that way, but it doesn't physiologically actually exist. So, like, the analogy, the physiological analogy she's trying to make is not even based in reality. Like, it's not even actually a thing. And lit, got literally, guys, this, he, okay. The ritual of proof, the titular risk, ritual of proof, is where if a well-born man is being given to a name giver, the equivalent of their parliament, like the, the leaders of the various parties of their parliament, go into a small room and inspect his dick to make sure that this membrane is still there. This is the ritual. This is the titular ritual. And like, there's this whole power struggle between him and her. And he's like, if you make me go through this ritual, you'll find that it's not intact. And she's like, haha, I think that it is. And like, just like, just take, just take some moments to process what it's like reading this and then expecting the author for you to just take this seriously. Okay, so anyway, she, the ritual of proof, she waves it because she does, she knows that it will make him feel like undignified and like, yeah, no shit. Like side note to my fellow romance readers who read historicals, when was the last time there was actual a physical inspection of the heroine's genitals to make sure her hymen was still intact? I have, I have not read one of those and maybe it used to be more common. I don't think I've ever read one of those. And like, it's just so, the way it's talked about is so degrading and like very slave-like. It feels, it feels icky. And then the actual like ritual is that he like, okay, so when they actually have sex, Literally the man is tied to a bed so that he can't resist because it's so painful when the woman like sits on him and takes away his veil that it just feels really kind of like, and he doesn't want it. Like that's the thing, Jorlin is saying no again and again in this book. And like, yeah, it's that thing in romance sometimes where it's like no but means yes. But I feel like we're getting away from that. And I should acknowledge this book was written I think maybe like 20 years ago. So like maybe this is anachronistic of me to expect this to be the paradigm. But like he's saying no again and again. And like eventually she arouses him so much that he's like, okay, fine. And like untie, and then he's like, I want to have sex with you, untie me. And she basically is like, no, it's gonna hurt you so bad that you'd accidentally hurt me, I can't. And then like sits on his dick. It just, it feels like consent wise, it just feels icky. Here we go. At first, Jorlin felt nothing but unbelievable pleasure. It was so incredible that he cried out with it. Her warmth and moisture, oh gosh, guys, I'm sorry. Her warmth and mo moisture coated him everywhere. He felt as if he had glided into a cushion of slick, pulsing comfort, so then it hit. That's in italics, so you know it's serious. The first burning wave of agony, it seared the tip of his manhood, spreading throughout the entire head and down the shaft. Get off. Green shook her head. So like, there's just a lot of like consent stuff in here that's icky. And that can happen a lot in historical romances, which honestly is a part of why that's not my favorite subgenre. And I struggle to find ones that I really like in it. But like this, I feel like is a particularly like old way of talking about consent that just felt icky and not great to me. So like, even aside from the batshit crazy pieces of the world building, just the like relationship dynamic did not feel cool to me. And speaking of things that are not cool, there's also like sometimes really weird like race stuff in this book. She's talking to one of her counsel, like one of her like advisors. And she says, I really think you secretly admire my choice avatar. Be honest, do you like the fire he shows? It appeals to your tribal spirit. Avatar's people had originally hailed from the far southern tribes whose origin ancestresses were in the Neofem's maintenance division. It was only in the last 300 years that the branch of the tribes had been incorporated back into one nation. And like, it just, it seems very clear that this is a parallel to like, either like native peoples, like 
Aboriginal type peoples or First Nations type peoples or like people from Africa. I'm not sure, but there's just a lot of like weird little allusions to that. And I'm like, this is a fantasy world. Why did you have to bring this into... Why did you have to bring the grossness of our world into the fantasy world? I don't know. Okay, so anyway, I could go on and on and on and read you more quotes, but like I probably don't need to at this point. I think you get a pretty good sense of like the tone and the writing level of this book. And the other thing that I should mention that I think like towards the end of the book, the things that I'm not gonna talk to you guys about or re suffer you to listen to is that, so it's a sci-fi world, right? Like up, you are consistently hearing like that this is a sci-fi world. And then, Towards the end of the book, like, or towards the, I guess maybe in the middle-ish, you find out that Jorlin is something called a sensitive, which means, I think, like, basically kind of like an empath, but, like, extreme. So, like, there's some level of, and it's unclear if it's, like, a genetic thing or if it's, like, supernatural in some way. Like, it's unclear, but you kind of, I don't know, I kind of defaulted to feeling like, okay, I guess this is some sort of, like, genetic fluke in him. But then... Then it turns out later in the book that he like can directly communicate to this god. So like you already have a sci-fi world and then you're introducing these fantasy elements into it late. And I just don't, I think it's somewhat of a category error because like, sorry, I feel sort of, I'm like my sister, my daughter, my sister, my daughter. Like I feel so conflicted because I appreciate the thought experiment of this, of like doing a Regency romance with a gender swap. But I think what it is, is that adding in the sci-fi and fantasy element to this book doesn't make sense because, okay, I don't want to get too deep into this, but basically like patriarchy came into being because of resource constraints. Essentially, there was a time in human history where men and women were pretty equal because the work was divided very equally. And once we settled down into like agricultural settlements and stuff, patriarchy developed because women, like their role changed basically. They were not seen as co-laborers or necessary to the work involved in providing sustenance. And they became like, it essentially allowed there to be a market to be dicks to them and like to like dominate them. So like, if you're assuming that this is a sci-fi world where we have taken care of a number of problems, like for instance, she has like this little implant that like she turns on and off based on whether or not she wants to get pregnant. Like if she wants to be pregnant, she's just like beep, beep, boop, boop, and like she can get pregnant. And then when she doesn't, she's like beep, beep, boop, boop, and like can't. So, you know, clearly in terms of like resource stuff, we have like made some leaps and bounds in this world. And so the whole idea that there needs to be a dominant gender doesn't make sense. Like why in a world of plenty, in a world of a lot of progress in technology, like I at least want to hope, I mean, that's what we've seen, right? Like as we, as we as a human race become more and more prosperous, there is more and more room for equality because this like sense of like the need to hold on to conservative like ideas and stuff is diminished because survival is not as much at stake. That's why you see like more, anyway, like let's not get too far into that. But basically I just think this is maybe like a category error of like why in this advanced civilization is, is this whole subjugation of men even happening? Like it doesn't make sense. And then when you add in the fantasy element, I don't know, it just gets real murky and confusing. And I just don't like, this is why I say it's the craziest book I've ever read because like every page I'm just sitting here going like back and forth and back and forth about like what? Like I admire the ambition, but like this is crazy and it makes me like, it just, it messes with my head. So anyway, like long story short, like just to wrap this up for anybody who's curious, like if you don't want to find out how this ends, maybe skip ahead a couple of minutes. But basically like, so she gets pregnant kind of against his will like he doesn't want her to get pregnant because then he'll be stuck with their baby all the time because men are the caregivers in this world but then like she has the baby and it's a boy and she names it her heir even though that's like crazy and Claudine D'Ambert is essentially like mac like having machinations against her to get their union declared invalid because she's gel like she hates her I was never 100% sure there for I think this book also wants to be like political intrigue and it's just not like that doesn't not very successfully anyway in my opinion so anyway like she's trying to do that and then basically she and somehow Claudine and and Green end up like in a duel like they're challenging each other to a duel and then like Jorlin intervenes and like there's magic that saves them and then like everybody lives happily ever after I guess like I don't know but anyway like this book all this to say this is the craziest book I've ever read the world building is not good and does not make sense it is very info dumpy and it's world building the prose is not 
great. I think the creativity is somewhat limited. I think that choosing to put a Regency romance on in space just doesn't make sense. Just to jump in real quick, I did want to just mention that I think an example of this being more successful in terms of taking a Regency type story and putting it in a different world is Hearthstone by L. Catherine White. It definitely is a book that has lower ambitions than Ritual of Proof, but I do think that it actually kind of meets those ambitions. Um, so I'm not saying that it's impossible to take a Regency type story and put it in a different world. I think this is an example where somebody has done that pretty well. But for having said all of that, I mean, I appreciate the ambition and I do appreciate any book that is trying to, you know, kind of subvert our expectations about the patriarchy or gender roles or whatever. So like in that respect, because like when was this published? I need to, let me double check here. If this says like 2012, I'm gonna lose my mind. 2001, okay. So it's been like, it's almost 20 years old at this point. So, you know, I appreciate that, I appreciate the ambition for the time that this was written because actually 17 years in romance is a long time. Like we have come away. So like, I appreciate the ambition. I just think that this is bad and kind of crazy. That being said, I actually would recommend it because like if you just want to laugh or like want to read, this is so much of what I think people think all of romance is like. So like, and it's, and it's not, but like if you want to read a book like that, that's not well written and kind of crazy and like weird, then this is the one. Like this is the craziest book I've ever read. I, like I said, I still have friends because I remember when I first read this, describing it to people and reading them passages and then being like that's this is a thing like I can't believe this is actually a thing it is a thing and um yeah anyway I'm pretty tired I feel like I need to go drink something maybe something with alcohol in it uh to kind of do a palate cleanse but anyway I wanted you guys I wanted to have at least one thing in this month of romance that was representative of some of the not as good parts of romance so ritual proof thank you for that serving that purpose thank you for making me laugh and now I think it's time for our journey together to come to an end. I think I have one more video in my month of romance coming up, but we're basically at the end. Uh, we're at towards the end here of February and uh, yeah, I think I'm ready to move on to mystery, to March Mystery Madness. I think I need some palette cleanse from that. If you've ever read this book, definitely let me know what you thought. If you're somebody who loves this book, I mean, I I can see how, like I can see why and I can see how. I don't agree in terms of like, I don't like it, but you know, feel free to, to leave a spirited defense of it in the comments. Um, feel free to let me know if you've read it and did not like it, uh, like me. Um, but anyway, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I do this so that you don't have to. And um, yeah, like, subscribe, follow me on social meets if you're so inclined. All that information is listed in the description box below. So if you guys would take a look at that, I would really appreciate it. Um, but other than that, I think that that's all I have to say for now. Um, and I will just talk to you guys, I think, on Thursday. Okay, bye.